Welcome to the Evangelism Podcast. I'm Daniel King, and I'm excited about telling people about Jesus. Today, I have a very special guest with me, Pastor Anthony Greco. Thank you so much for being with me on the Thank Evangelism you. Podcast. Uh, it's just an honor to be here with you, and I've uh, been following you for quite a number of years, heard some amazing things, and we have a lot of mutual friends, and appreciate what you're doing for the cause of Christ around the world. Well, thank you. You are a pastor mm -hmm. here in Calgary, Alberta. Yep. And you are also an evangelist. Yes. And so tell me about how you got started as an evangelist. <laughs> well, well, you know, I gave my life to Christ in uh, 1982. Born in a very strong, devout Catholic family and uh, had an encounter with Jesus when I was 18. I was in a trailer counting my beer money to see how drunk I could get with my drinking buddies. And his roommate came in and uh, opened up his Bible and shared Christ with me. And five minutes later, I was on my knees and I accepted Jesus. And it was, uh, it was a powerful moment where I literally felt, you know, something just lift off my life. The lights came on and, and I was experiencing this, this presence of Jesus. And, you know, I had never experienced anything like that. And I, I remember, I didn't know if I should laugh or cry, but on the inside, I was like, this is real. He's alive. And I heard a voice on the inside of me say, yeah, uh, I'm real, and you're going to tell your generation, you know, I'm real. Something to that effect. You know how when God speaks to you, you kind of interpret that. It wasn't like an audible voice, but it was so undeniable. And so that's how it started. And uh, then uh, someone put some T.L. Osborne material in my hand, and it just resonated. I couldn't put it down. And so... And so because of T.L. Osborne's mm -hmm. story of going to India, mm -hmm. you decided to go to India <laughs> and test it out to see if it really yeah, worked. Yeah, I and thought, so what happened? Okay, so I go to India, and so there's a, I, I go to New Delhi, and I see these posters everywhere. Come see the miracles of Jesus, the blind see, the deaf hear, the lame walk, thousands hear the good news. Jesus heals regardless of caste, creed, or religion. Canadian evangelist Peter Youngren. And I thought, wow, I mean, my first thought was, are you allowed to advertise like that? Isn't that presumption? But anyway, I ended up meeting him. And uh, so he's, you know, I, I just said, hey, I'm from uh, Cranbrook, BC. And I said, I've heard of you and uh, never met you, but I'd like to help. What can I do? And he, he says, well, you got a good camera there. Why don't you take pictures of the miracles as they happen? And then he looked at my, 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 my traveling partner, Rod Harris, and says, and you, you record them as they happen. I said, yes. So we left that meeting, we went back to our hotel room, and we burst out laughing. Like, like he was so matter of fact. And I mean, I believed in the, in the miraculous, you know, but I'd never seen a miracle. I mean, maybe a sore knee or a sore elbow, or, but I'd never seen blind eyes open, you know, or deaf ears. And so I thought, all right, so that first night, I show up at the stadium and uh, big open field, and there's, you know, a couple thousand people that first night. And Peter begins to preach, presenting Jesus. And you could just feel the atmosphere get charged with faith and possibility. He gives the altar call and, you know, scores of people run forward and dust is coming up. And I'm like, I, I've never seen that. And then he began to uh, command miracles to happen. And this is what I was waiting for. So I got the camera and I'm ready. And, uh, you know, he did it in categories, which right away I was disappointed, Daniel. I thought, you don't do it in categories. I think I was, I think I was looking for something spectacular and sensational. You know, I, I, and I thought once I saw that, that I would be transformed, that it would, I would instantly have faith. I was looking for some, some kind of, of a religious experience that would fit into my frame of reference, or not reference, but I, what I would imagined. He starts with the deaf commanding deaf spirits to come open, come out and blind eyes to open and cripples. And I'm, I'm watching this and I'm, I'll never forget this little girl who had never walked and a uh, beautiful purple plaid dress on and her father, a wonderful Sikh man, you know, beard and turban. And he's got tears running down his eyes onto his beard, onto his, his vest that he was wearing, a sweater vest and big wet spots. And he's laughing and crying and his little girl who had never walked is walking back and forth and he's holding his big belly and laughing and crying. And he's like, look what Jesus has done. Look what Jesus has done. And there was so many miracles that night. Daniel, I didn't believe it. You I, saw it with your own eyes and you still I, didn't believe it. I didn't believe it. It was like water off a duck's back. So I go back to the YMCA where I was staying in, in, in New Delhi and Jai Singh Road and 
And I was, that whole night I tossed and turned. I ended up getting on the balcony and I'm crying out to God. And I said, God, obviously Peter Youngren was in really fine form. And Jesus, you were awesome as always, but what's wrong with me? Why can't I believe what I saw? I always said, if I see it, I'll believe it. And it really comes down to, you know, and this is what I understood that night after wrestling. I realized that so much of my Christianity was in the realm of my, in, in, was shaped by, by my worldview. And in the West, it's such a, a worldview shaped by logic and reason. Well, it was back then. Now it's about feelings, but that's a whole nother, another story. But back then it was so much about, um, you know, if I can taste it, if I can measure it, if I can touch it, then I'll accept it as a reality. And I understood that night that my worldview was very much a natural worldview. Over in India and different parts of the world, as you well know, there's a supernatural worldview. And so when I understood that, you know, you know, Christ, you know, you know, the natural mind receives not the things of God. I, I, I will never be able to figure, download God into my brain. He'd literally blow your mind. But yet our spiritual capacity, Christ lives on the inside of us. And I understood that night that my, the spiritual reality of the new creation, that capacity to believe and know God is far beyond my intellect. And so in the West, we've elevated reason and logic above the place of simple childlike faith and spiritual realities. And so that night I repented of my hardness of heart, asked Jesus to help me, and uh, begin to really able to appreciate and not be critical and cynical about the miracles that I saw. And since you first connected with Pastor Peter Youngren, mm -hmm. you helped to organize some mm -hmm. of the big gospel festivals mm -hmm. that he's done in, in different parts of the world. And, and even till today, mm -hmm. you're, you're continuing mm -hmm. to, to work with him. So, so tell me about some of the adventures. What, what <laughs> comes to mind of the, these different countries you've gone to and what God has done? Well, in the, in the early days, so I'm, I'm working in Cranbrook. I'm a manager of a pizza hut. And I would, I would save up my money. And I went, you know, when I had money, I'd phone Peter and say, where are you going? You know? And then I'd, I'd go in advance and help set up. And so one day, we were watching the news, and so he lived in eastern Canada, in the Toronto area, and I lived in British Columbia. While the Soviets, you know, they invade Afghanistan, and, and millions of Afghan refugees begin to pour over the border into Pakistan. So Peter calls me, and he says, Anthony, you know, did you, are you watching the news? I said, yeah. I said, it's amazing. And he says, well, the Afghans have never been reached with the gospel. He goes, that's one of the last strongholds of darkness. We need to go there. And I said, okay, what do you want to do? And he says, well, let's go to Peshawar right by the Khyber Pass. And, let's, you know, and he says, can you go in advance and set it up for me? I said, sure. Sure, no problem. Why not? You didn't know what was I, impossible. I, I, I didn't know. So I went. And uh, so I meet with all the pastors there. Now, when I was there, it was the same time that Osama bin Laden was in Peshawar working on behalf of the CIA, getting support from the, from the CIA to buy stingers and mules and weapons. And so the KGB was in the city setting off bombs in the marketplace, trying to force the government to push the Afghan refugees back into the refugee camps because when they were coming into the city, they were getting finances, they were getting arms, and so it was chaos. So I'm there meeting with all the bishops and priests and pastors from every imaginal spectrum of Christianity, telling them what we want to do. And they're like, you're crazy. There's bombs going off. You're going to get us all killed. You don't understand what it is to be a minority and a Muslim majority. And, and so they, they forced me. They said, now you're going to call Pastor Peter and tell him to cancel the meetings. Because the previous 36 hours, I think it was six or nine bombs, had gone off in the marketplace. So I got all the bishops and priests and pastors in a in a house and I'm on the, you know, the telephone. We didn't, have, we didn't have cell phones or internet or fax machines at that day. I call Peter and I explain the situation and he just yells back and he goes, Anthony, tell them I'm coming. And he hung up the phone. <laughs> I mean, it was like the air, Daniel, the air was sucked out of that room and they were just so despondent. But Peter arrived and we saw, and in, I mean, the first miracles were among, we had a lot of the Afghanis, experience. We had two interpreters, so we were speaking in uh, Urdu and Pashto, and saw amazing miracles, predominantly among the Muslims. And I remember going to the Bible Society and buying every piece of scripture they had, and we gave it to all those Muslim that were demanding Bibles and scriptures. It was, it was fantastic to see. Let's talk about power evangelism. Mm -hmm. Why is it important for people to see the power of God at work? I love the old African proverb, which you've probably heard. You're walking down the road and the road splits in two and you don't know which way to go. One road has a, a man that's dead, another one has a live. Which one are you going to ask for directions? 
And I think our message is the resurrection of Jesus. And I, I think in North America, we focus on Christ died for our sins. Uh, the penalty was paid, but we don't emphasize enough that the keys of death, hell, and the grave are in the belt in the hands of Jesus. He rose from the grave. He's the only one. And he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And miracles, you know, they attest, they confirm the message. TL said to me, he says, you know, if you abide in my word, then you are my disciples indeed. We need to have the deeds to authenticate our message. Because anyone can talk about what their prophet or guru, you know, had said. And so this, and there's also, when you go to areas where they are held in darkness, and maybe there's false religions or demonic powers or occult, until you demonstrate that your message has greater power than theirs, uh, it's very difficult for them to put their faith in Christ. So we, we must have miracles. Paul put an emphasis on it. And the only time we see that Paul didn't have a lot of fruits in his ministry was when he went to Mars Hill. And he just, he had a great, you know, apologetic discourse with the leaders. And they said, we'll hear you again on this matter. But everywhere else, you know, in the book of Acts, it's like, the Holy Spirit moves, and then the church plays catch up. Day of Pentecost, boom! And they're like, Peter's like, whoa, what is, oh, oh, I know what this is. This is that which was prophesied by the prophet Joel. 3,000 people are saved. Acts chapter 3, boom, a lame man gets healed. Don't look at us as if, you know, it was by our... And so you see this pattern in the book of Acts where miracles change the spirit. There are signs and wonders, and signs point to something. And they make you wonder, who is this Jesus? And so I have found that that is absolutely vital. And it can quickly, and Jesus said, even to Sodom and well, to uh, Chorazin and, and some of the cities, you know. And he said, if the miracles that were done in you were done in Sodom and Gomorrah, they would have repented. So miracles have an ability to bring repentance and change of mind and change of attitude in, 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 in different people groups. I've heard you say the gospel of Jesus is Jesus. Yeah. What do you mean by that? <laughs> you know, it's, uh, you know, that's the good news, man, is that, you know, uh, uh, every, every religion is propagated usually by the parents and then it's affirmed by, you know, uh, maybe a priest or a monk or a guru or a holy man and through certain, certain ceremonies that are performed in pagodas or temples or mosques or whatnot, right? Uh, only in Christianity is our, in the gospel, what's unique is that our message is advanced by the participation of the founder himself. <laughs> you know, the Lord went with them, you know, you know, confirming the word. And when people encounter Jesus, our message is a person. You, you, you don't become an adherent to a doctrine or you join a religious movement or take membership in a mm -hmm. denomination. You encounter Jesus and you find in him he's everything you need your savior, your healer, the baptizer in the Holy Spirit, restorer, deliverer, you know, he's everything. He's the life. And so that's what I get excited is that the good news about Jesus is I know that when someone says yes, they can encounter, they're going to have a, an encounter with the living resurrected savior. So you have the heart of an evangelist and now you're <laughs> pastoring. And so what's that like to go from traveling, doing crusades to, to now being a pastor and and, and how have you brought those two different giftings and callings together? Yeah, I mean that's a, I mean that's a tension that I'm, I'm still trying to learn how to, how to manage because you go overseas and it's, it's, it's proclamation. You know, North America was a little bit more explanation. Now, do I still expect the miraculous to happen in my church setting? Absolutely. And just I heard a testimony just a few nights ago of a young gal that had a, a, a cyst, you know, on her ovary, and we prayed, and she went to the doctor and it vanished. We've seen blind eyes open. But what I recognize in the church is that, you know, as a, you know, a, a pastor, you know, when I started, someone said to me, Anthony says, you know, well, actually, I heard John Maxwell say this at a conference. He said, the weakness of the charismatic Pentecostal church is you guys overestimate the event and underestimate the process. And so the shift that I've had to make is to think long term, build relationship, because now I'm planted in this community, I've been here for 23 years. And I want to, you know, invite people into that relationship over that process of time to come to Christ. The I, I really believe that, that a great pastor, according to Jesus in Luke 15, leaves the 99 safe sheep to go after the one lost sheep. And so I think it's the number one job of every pastor is not to grow deeper disciples, 
but is to reach lost people. And so when we thought about our church, and so how I look at it, I think it's the angle scale that talks about in a scale of one to 10, the five is where someone gets born again. Eight, nines, and tens are your solid, mature believers that can feed themselves. Your zero, ones, and twos are those that are not even interested in spiritual reality. Everything, how we've designed our church is with, I'm thinking of the threes and fours, which are the people that are starting to ask questions. Is there more to life than this? What about Jesus? Is the Bible true? What happens when I die? You know, and five, of course, is born again. Six and seven are new believers. So I prepare my messages for three to six or four to sevens. I figure that, well, the zero ones and twos, they're not there. Eights, nines and tens. Come on, you can feed yourself. I'm not getting fed in church. Really? You know, you're, you're like, I have. You need to be feeding someone else. You need to be feeding someone else. Now take some responsibility. So that's how I gear my church. And so I had to make big adjustment on, you know, how I speak, using layman's terms, you know, uh, eradicating some of our Christian churchianity and Christianese so that it's very welcoming. And, And I've seen people come in and some of them, you know, especially some of the more educated, affluent people, they may take a year or two before they actually make a decision for Christ. They're really watching everything. But I still believe job number one, ultimately, I think you, is, is, is reaching that one lost person. We're here together at the Advanced Evangelist Summit, and it's really wonderful to see all these different evangelists mm-hmm. from around Canada come together yeah. here in Calgary and have a heart for evangelism. And I think one of the things that God wants to do is to raise up more proclamation Mm. evangelists who will go and preach the gospel Mm. with strength and with demonstration and with power. (laughs) Like you do, (laughs) like you do. And and so what advice would you give to to a young person who who would like to be a a proclamation evangelist? Maybe they don't even know what that is, but they, they want to tell thousands of people about Jesus. You know, I had a, a great, one of the great mentors in my life is a man named Wayne Myers, and uh, he's down in Mexico City, he just turned 100. And one day I asked him, I said, why don't we have a lot of miracles in North America, like we see overseas? And he says, you know, he says, Saul never killed a giant, and he never had giant killers under his ministry, or under his tenure. And he says, David killed a giant, and then, you know, uh, some of my, his mighty men, you know, killed off you know, the brothers of Goliath. And he says, you can't give what you, what you don't have. So I would say this, all that to say, who's doing it? Who's, who, who's caring and demonstrating what you want? Go, go draw near. Connect with them. People like yourself, you know. And I know there's a, you were, we're talking about the boot camp with Daniel Kalenda, my friend Peter Young. There, there are people that are operating in this. I would say, go and serve under those ministries. Draw close, study, hunger and thirst after it. It's that association. Submission is such a powerful thing because when you're submitted, what's the anointing that's on the mission comes on you. And I would say, I wouldn't be here today without. Peter's mentorship, him acknowledging the gift that's in me, giving me opportunity, correcting me, you know, fine-tuning. And so that is an absolute important thing. Pastors are going to produce pastors, and teachers are going to produce teachers. Evangelists will produce evangelists. Find, put yourself in those environments and step out on faith and be bold. Let's talk about what God is doing in Canada. For many years, Canada has sent missionaries around the world. So many Canadian churches have a heart for missions. Mm. And now what we see is that people from around the world are coming to Canada. And so right here in Calgary, you have people from many different nations, many different cultures, and and it's like God is bringing the mission field to you. And I know in your church, you have people from many different backgrounds. What would you say to other pastors in Canada about this mission field that God is bringing here? Uh, I mean... I was just talking to one of the local pastors here and told me that in the northeast quadrant of my city, Calgary, now Calgary's about, I think it's 1.3, 1.4 million, but in that quadrant, there are 440,000, and 81% of those people, so over 300,000, are new immigrants. They're new Canadians. There are Muslims, there are Hindus, they're in our backyard. And I, th- I think what the inside of the church must reflect the outside of the church. You know, we're multicultural our church. We have about 50 different nationalities represented. And we, uh, you know, it's a, the, the challenge is, I don't want to be culturally specific. I need to be culturally sensitive. And so I look what's on my platform. Is my platform all white guys or white women? Does it reflect my leadership, everything? 
And I think that that is so absolutely key. And so one of the best things is, is you got to start connecting, you know, with people from other nations, other lands. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm blessed and fortunate that I've been able to be in 40 different nations. And so when I meet my Nigerian friends and I say, oh, did you bring any suya? You know, and uh, I ask them about, oh, you got the kilishi, you know, a puff puff. You know, I talk about the food. We make that connection. Um, I do that with my, with my Muslim friends, with my Hindu friends. And I, I try to learn a little phrase in each language where I go. And so when I meet someone, I can just drop a few words. And shoot, because I know what it's like. My wife's an immigrant. English is not her first language. She's from Sweden. We met in India, got engaged in Nigeria. My mom and dad were immigrants that come to this land. I grew up in a street where every house was built by an Italian. I always felt like I didn't belong. I always felt like I was an outcast. And if you've never lived in another country, you don't understand what that's like. I lived in Sweden for four years. I know what it's like to feel like you're an outcast. You don't understand the culture, the jokes, the language. I had to learn it. And I think as the Canadian church, what an incredible opportunity. But we got to break out of our old Canadian mindset and realize our nation has changed. We are, we, per capita, I read yesterday or this week, per capita Canadians have brought in more new immigrants than any other nation on the planet. I am 100% in favor of it. And the opportunities to win them, to befriend them, open up in English as a second language, put on an international day, you know, invite your Muslim friends in. I invite, I met an Iranian family at the park and I'm teasing with the guy and I said, teach me some Farsi. He says, gumsho, gumsho, which is really rude way of saying get lost. He shows up in my church months later. I look at him, I said, gumsho, gumsho. He laughs because he knew I remembered him. And so his son comes to our, to our youth. He's like, I'm a Muslim, but he's coming to our youth. It's a long game we're playing, you know, but I think that's, that is an awesome opportunity as Canadians. And, you know, we, we have a, you know, in America, you have the melting it's pot. It's a great opportunity. It is. And the church needs to take advantage of it. Yeah. And you know what? Those people are open for signs and wonders. And uh, even I read a study that nine out of every 10 Canadians has had some kind of supernatural encounter. What a great conversation starter. You ever have a spiritual experience? And all of a sudden, so what do you think of spiritual reality? It could be a ghost or a demon or something, you know, something really. But we are, Canada has changed, our mindset has changed, and I think, yeah, it is an opportunity. That's awesome. Well, Pastor Anthony, thank you so much for being on the Evangelism Podcast. I appreciate it. <laughs> thank you so much, Daniel. I know we could talk for a long time. You've got so many stories. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Another time. Thank you. Daniel King is on a mission to save one million souls a year, but he can't do it alone. Would you consider sowing a financial seed today? To give, please visit www.kingministries.com.